scripture reading for today is Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. Hear these words. Then they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one, for you do regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see it. And they brought him one. And then he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? And they answered, the emperor's. Jesus said to them, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God. And they were utterly amazed at him. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we're going to dig into the teachings of Jesus. I hope you're as excited about this as, as me. It's a it's a marvelous endeavor that we take upon ourselves to try to listen well. We want to listen well to what uh, is remembered that Jesus said in the time in which uh, he said it and it was recorded, as well as try our, our best to discern what would be the, the timeless truth of what he was saying and how it might make some sense for us and uh, be an application in our lives. Uh, being the, uh, the extension of the 4th of July weekend, I thought maybe uh, the issue of Caesar and God might be uh, a good one to turn to Jesus and, and think about. And so that's why this one comes up first, just because of the calendar dates, not for any other reason. We're looking at Jesus' teachings about Caesar and about God, about taxes ostensibly, but maybe really not. To a challenge on paying taxes and the implied allegiances, Jesus responds, as you heard Candace say, with that memorable saying, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, render unto God what is God. The things of Caesar give back to Caesar. Croson translates it as, the things of God give back to God. And Jesus set in motion a 2,000-year debate on Christian citizenship from the roots, his roots in Jewish theocracy to our modern secular state. What's to be our thinking about things of Caesar and things of God? Our scripture passage and the words that it contains about Jesus appear in the synoptics. It appears in the Gospel of Thomas. It's given a high level of authenticity. Uh, most scholars uh, think that Jesus said, indeed, these words. So we, we take that kind of assurance as we go to the study of, of, these, uh, of this lesson. Jesus' retort to the question of taxes, this is I'm reading from a book called The Five Gospels, is a masterful bit of enigmatic repartee. Huh. Couldn't he just say what he meant, right? Well, he couldn't, and that's part of the point. He avoids the trap laid for him by the question without really resolving the issue. He doesn't advise them to pay taxes, and he doesn't advise them not to pay taxes. He advises them to know the difference between the claims of the emperor and the claims of God. And by way of what he said, the faithful who were listening between the lines or underneath the words understood Jesus as challenging Caesar as God, which Caesar 
wanted to be and proposed himself to be and required his citizens to agree to. Jesus was challenging Caesar as God in offering a different kingdom, a different kingdom way. Now, there were noticeable differences I, I want to highlight for you between the ways of Caesar and the ways of God. Rome's empire was violent. It was characterized by domination. God's empire was, as presented by Jesus, was nonviolent characterized by service and by, by liberation. Rome's empire was preoccupied with power, status, money. As a matter of fact, it was fueled by the love of power. God's empire was preoccupied by generosity. And it was fueled by the power of God. You're starting to see, are you not being reminded of the two different ways by which <laughs> that Jesus was talking about? Rome's empire created a, a domination pyramid that put a powerful and violent man at the top with chains of command and submission that put everybody else in their place beneath the supreme leader. And God's empire, on the other hand, created a network, a network of family, of solidarity and mutuality among people. Perhaps an upside down pyramid, you might say. where the least, the last, and the lost became welcomed and honored in people to be a part of the family. God's empire created a different way of doing life, presented a different way of having life than the emperor's empire. The Roman Empire and Jesus' envisioned kingdom of God were different. To Jesus they were different. What he said about them was different. And as Jesus called attention to the things of Caesar and the things of God, he challenged people to Identify those things. What are those things in your thinking, he would say. That's what he was doing here. What are those things? And, and consider their claim, the claim of those things upon you. Now, it's, it's my sense that Jesus hoped people would pick up on other key things that he had said as they went through that exercise other teachings he had offered, which to my mind can all kind of be summarily put under the greatest commandment. Jesus does not see the things of Caesar and the things of God on the same level with the same authority for us. God always has priority. Our allegiance is always supposed to be to God who asks of us the love of the holy with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind. What's left out? Well, theoretically, nothing. With all of us, with the fullness of who we are, to love the holy and to love our neighbor as ourselves. 
When we take this to heart and make this the guide of our lives, we follow our Lord by living faithfully in all aspects of our lives, right? That, that would be the outcome of that, all aspects of our lives. Carrying our, our religious perspectives into the marketplace and into the public arenas of Caesar. And seeking a, a social contract with our neighbors that reflects the best of our spiritual imperatives of loving. Justice, mercy, peace. You know, so at first blush, it may seem that Jesus is saying, folks, distinguish the sacred from the secular. That's what I want you to do. Distinguish those two. They're two different spheres. Jesus is promoting a, uh, a workable detente under the pressure of Roman oppression. Yet it seems if we're really paying attention to Jesus, it seems he's really saying all, all of life is God's. And so we should aspire to holiness and righteousness. We should aspire to the sacred in all of life. In the fullness of our lives, in whatever spheres we might find ourselves. The town hall or the sanctuary. Whatever sphere the religious, the political, the social, the economic, the cultural, whatever sphere. Jesus encourages people to transform Caesar's empire into God's kingdom. That's the work we are supposed to be about yet using the ways and the means of faith, which is the most important thing to Jesus, rather than the ways and the means of the emperor. The kingdom of God is not made through acting like the empire of Caesar. The means, the ways by which, shape the effects of the ends. The ends don't justify the means. The means need to be congruent with the ends. If we're working for the kingdom of God, our work needs to be kingdom work. It needs to be in the spirit and the ways and the means of Jesus. You following what I'm saying? I think this is Jesus. I think this is what Jesus is saying. I don't think this is Dilge. It's my mouth moving, but I think this is the Lord's teachings about rendering the things of Caesar and the things of God. All spheres under the sovereignty of God. All spheres acted into under the sovereignty of God, in the ways of God, in the manners of Jesus. So let's jump forward to our, our, our situation now and, and uh, the blessings that are ours um, in our lives, in our country, the circumstance we have different than what people are having in Peru or Brazil or uh, Ukraine or China or elsewhere. We're, we're Christians here in America. And we're thinking about this lesson in terms of us, our lives. It might sound a little different if, if we were in a different place. Jefferson gifted all of us with the separation of church and state. Now, he might have been following Jesus' lesson here of detente of Caesar and God. I'm not quite sure 
Remember, Jefferson wasn't very big on the miracles of Jesus, but he was a follower of the lessons of Jesus. You knew that about Jefferson? In the Jefferson Bible, how he cut out all the miracles, anything supernatural, were taken out of the Gospels. So Jefferson's Bible was a Bible without any miracles. He actually did that. He cut, he cut, and he pasted, and he made a Bible of himself. It's called the Jefferson Bible. I've got it in my office if you want to take a look at it. Jefferson articulated the Virginia Constitution. And he pushed to develop the ideas of that into our federal constitution, influencing Madison, as Madison drafted, mostly Madison, the First Amendment, with its clause of the establishment, the establishment clause it's called, and the free exercise clause. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Free exercise, therefore. Jefferson wanted a hard wall for us all between government and church. He knew the tyranny of one upon the other, going both ways. Knowing it in English history, seeing it in French life. Yet he recognized that in, uh, in, the, in reality, the, the wall was actually permeable. Since people lived in both the political and the religious sphere. Yes? We might put on different hats, but we are the same human. So he sought a way for both spheres to thrive and to blossom, influencing each other without controlling each other. This is our context as I understand it. And it's, and it's a timely uh, subject for us to consider because we're, we're well aware that um, as, as we've gone through the decades, we Americans, we've had rulings of our, of our Supreme Court have tried to make sense of this constitutional um, provision, you know, and, and there's been uh, times when it seemed one way or another, times when, it's, when certain people have felt the church has been uh, abridged and insulted, and other times when people are feeling the church has been indulged and uh, overly supported. Uh, you, you may remember just in our lifetime that there's been court cases on uh, prayer in school. There's been court cases on whether the Ten Commandments could be placed in a courtroom. There's been court cases about Harmful religious practices, handling of snakes, is that allowed? Burning this or burning that. Is it allowed to not allow your children medical care because of a religious point of view? And then just in recent weeks, are we allowed to uh, discriminate in the practice of our business if our religion seems to indicate that we don't want to do that business practice. I've even heard that there's a new push that elected officials should all be Christian. Have you heard about that? I don't, I don't know where that's coming up with because we actually have a clause in our Constitution that says there's no religious test for office. So it's... it's it's something that's, well, how do you ever measure it, let alone how do you get around that? This is our context as we try to listen to Jesus, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, render unto God the things that are God. And the truth is that our faith and our politics are interwoven. Each affects the other. Real people living in community have political 
and religious points of view. We all do, don't we? And each one of those seems to inform the other. There's a dialogue between the two. Philip Wogeman, a, a famous United Methodist pastor from Washington, D.C., and, and a professor at our seminary there, I, he's now retired, he, he writes in a, uh, in a book, for good or ill, for good or ill, politics affects Politics' effect upon human life and conduct and well-being can scarcely be exaggerated. Politics is important in the determining whether a people will be at war or at peace. Right? It is fundamental in the distribution of economic goods, including the definition of property rights. Politics is basic to the definition of crime and the determination of how it will be punished. Political decisions. It affects the degree to which people will be free to speak, to write, to worship. Politics defines who will be accepted as members of the community and who will be placed at the margins. We're seeing that it seriously influences the rearing of children. Well, we're seeing that, right? We're seeing that. By determining the circumstances of family life and establishing much of the subject matter of their education, he writes. Gosh, when did he write this? This is prescient. Um, it enters into the self-awareness of people, their self-identity and it projects in large measure their sense of historic destiny and accomplishment. All of these things, all of these things in our collective life that, that Wogeman highlights are grounded in and emerge from our politics. These things are things that we all think our faith has something to say about. We don't think it's a divided subject. We think our faith informs our attitudes, our thinking, our understanding of war, of property, of freedoms, of social rights, of child rearing, of family well-being our identity, our destiny, our values and our morals and our ethics shape how we interact, how we interact with one another. Do we slug somebody first and then talk about something or do we talk about something? How is it that we deal with one another? Hence, our faith gives direction, it gives perspective. And it indeed shapes our political sensibilities. Jesus lived in an authoritarian state. Roman rule, the emperor, no debate, no democracy there, no room for hardly a question or two without being killed. What's crucial to us through our circumstance, though our circumstances diverge from Jesus' circumstances, is to understand what was also crucial to Jesus, that we behave rightly, justly towards others with holiness and righteousness as we seek to connect with God, to partner with God, to bring about God's kingdom. As David French wrote in an article in today's New York Times, we need to have existential humility. That's what caught my attention. We need to have existential humility in all of our 
thinking, whether it's political or religious, acknowledging the limits of our wisdom and our virtue. He says a sense of superior self-virtue can create a sense of entitlement, damaging to others, damaging to ourselves. He's a proponent of original sin. That's what's behind what he's saying here. But he's acknowledging that none of us are the second coming. And it might be wise that we don't act like it as we deal with one another. As we discern Jesus' lesson for us today, as we, as we try to make sense of the things we read in the paper and what's going on in the world, and, and we try to come to a, a peace, a, a peace in our soul about how we, what we want to say and what we want to do and how we are a modern-day Christian. As, as we go about that whole thing, seeking God's lead and, and praying God's grace and mercy as we proceed. As we discern God's lesson for today, we note the hope that is expressed about human transformation and the transformation of the world. The hope in the kingdom of God that God's heaven would come on earth we pray daily, right? The hope in that, the yearning for that. And that that is anchored in our faithful living as people who are following the way, the way of Jesus, the ways of God, not the ways of Caesar. By letting love lead, I hope you're not getting tired of that phrase. By letting love lead, we are on our way in the right way of following Jesus' lead. Amen.